Thank you for everyone who's turned up, um, both in person and remotely. Um, this is our kind of first real hybrid AWS meetup that we've had. Um, hopefully we'll be able to do more of these in future after having just um, virtual meetups for the last couple of years nearly. Um, so my name's Andrew May. I'm the Cloud Solutions Lead at Leading Edge. Um, I'm a frequent contributor to this AWS meetup, but I'm not one of the organizers. I was hoping Angelo would be here. He's um, the main organizer. But I would say if anyone's interested in presenting at a meetup, or even if they've just got a topic they'd like to learn more about, then please put something in the chat on meetup.com. Um, say there's a topic you're interested in either in presenting or you'd like to learn more about, and we'll see if we can arrange a session. Not sure whether we'll have any more meetups this year. We've got reInvent coming up, and then we've got the sort of whole holiday period. So things get kind of crazy towards the end of the year, but I'm sure we'll resume early in the next year. And let's see if I can get this to work. There we go. So as I mentioned, I'm the Cloud Solutions Lead at Leading Edge. I've been with Leading Edge for, I think, 13 and a half years now. And in the last six years or so, I've been primarily focusing on cloud um, architecture, development, DevOps, infrastructure. Um, and I picked up a bunch of certifications along the way, just because I like the badges. And I like the stickers that I've got on my laptop that correspond to the badges. Um, so Leading Edge is a, an AWS partner and a network member. We're a select help consulting partner. We're based here, sort of in Dublin and Columbus, Ohio. Um, but we have people all around the country now, virtually, and we've got clients nationally. We specialize in doing cloud native development, migrations, DevOps. But we're also sort of able to do sort of full projects. We have project managers, scrum masters, BAs, et cetera. And we're always looking for qualified people in any of those categories. So what, so if you may not be familiar, I mean, I, I don't want to assume that everyone's a sort of computing geek in the same way that I am with sort of the history of ARM architectures. So ARM is advanced risk machines. It's a computer architecture or a set of CPU instructions, if you like. And ARM originally was advanced risk machines where risk is reduced instruction set computing, and that compares to complex instruction set computing as used in Intel CPUs. And it really started way back in the 80s when a company called Acorn Computing created the Acorn Archimedes computer as a replacement for the BBC B Micro across the schools of the UK. So I, I learned to do a lot of stuff on the BBC B, and um, that was in all the schools. I did see some of these Acorn Archimedes, but they never caught on to the same degree. But as part of the design of that, they created this new instruction set of, the, of this new ARM design. Now, over the years, where it really became dominant was in lower powered devices. So early phones like that Nokia GSM phone that's pictured in the 90s, and I think that's pretty much the model I used to call carry around when I was on call. Um, and then to so the first iPhone in 2007, that was an ARM chip as well. Now, a lot of us have used the Raspberry Pi devices that have come out and become really popular for sort of hobbyist projects. Um, those were still very much in that low power realm. But more recently, companies like Apple have put a huge amount of time into developing more powerful ARM um, chips first in their iPhones and their iPads, but more recently with the M1 chip, they're now replacing all of their Intel chips with ARM designs that they've created that are very high-powered designs, not just that sort of low power that ARM used to specialize in. So in some ways, it's come full circle back from where the Archimedes started out. So where does AWS play into this? Very much 
in the same way that Apple bought a company who specialized in sort of ARM architecture and chipset design uh, and sort of CPU design, AWS did the same sort of thing and bought a company in 2015, Annapurna, I think that's something like that. Um, and they released in 2018 the first generation of their Graviton CPUs. Now this, this initial design was very much based on a, a phone architecture, the ARM Cortex-A72, so that was very much what you find in phones of that era. It was 16 cores, which sounds like a lot, but when you're running a, a data center and you're virtualizing and you want to split up each um, CPU into lots of different virtual machines, 16 is not a lot. And they were only available as these A1 instance types that were relatively low powered compared to the comparable Intel and AMD processors. But just a year and perhaps a year and a bit later, they released Graviton 2. And this was a huge jump up in terms of both performance and availability across different AWS services. And that's really what we're going to be talking about tonight is where you can use these Graviton 2 processors. These are using a chip, uh, like a design that's been much more customized for use in cloud and data center environments where things are virtualized. We've got many more cores, so it allows them to split that up into, say, 32 two-core machines or however many you know, different sizes. And it's now available in different instance types and across a variety of services. So the big thing here is this is no longer a low-power design. This is potentially 40% better performance than the comparable Intel design. Um, and that's a huge deal. Now, that's not across every workload. There are certainly things that are optimized to the instruction set that they have on Intel, some of the extensions that they have that will still continue to perform better on those Intel CPUs. But for, for a lot of use cases, you are going to get better performance. And the nice thing is they're offering that to you at a 20% discount over the comparable Intel instances. So that's a, a big win on sort of total cost of ownership. One of the significant things here is that if each core that you get, when, when they talk about core like CPUs on virtual machines in AWS and other cloud platforms, they're always talking about these virtual CPUs. Well, in this case, if you get a virtual CPU, it's a full CPU core. But if you get an Intel virtual CPU, it's usually half of a core because it's a thread on a, a simultaneous multi-threading processor. So, and that's also why you typically get increments of two because if you've got two threads on a core, it's hard to split that up securely between virtual machines because there's various shared resources. And because there's shared resources there, that also means that while hyper-threading or multi-threading works well for many workloads, there are some where the threads contend with each other and don't get that full capability and the performance isn't as good. Now, one interesting thing this enables AWS to do is because these are set, only have a single thread, they can easily split off single core instances. So previously, most of the instance types, these CMR types, always started with two CPU, but they can now offer one CPU plus an amount of memory. And this can be a very cost-effective way. If you don't need a lot of compute, but possibly you need a relatively large amount of memory, you can use something like the R6G that's got eight gigs of memory, but only a single CPU core. And that's much cheaper than, say, an R5 um, large, which would have, you know, two CPU Intel and would be much more expensive. So just like a quick pricing comparison, this isn't comprehensive, but just a couple of examples. Uh, they recently released the M6i for where now I stands for Intel, so they're now in the newer generations going to explicitly distinguish Intel from Graviton from AMD. Um, that's got two hyper-threading cores, or, well, two hyper-threading, sing one single core, um, but two virtual CPU. And then you've got the, the Graviton equivalent that's 20% cheaper. Um, and then going down to the burstable instance types, uh, we've got the Intel, the T3s, there's not yet T4 Intel, 
Um, they released an AMD T3A, but that was 10% cheaper, but it was also a bit slower. But then the T4G is Graviton and it's 20% cheaper than that Intel equivalent, but it has that performance boost as well. Let's just see what I want to put in the chat. Echo's getting bad again, says Ned is talking. Do you have like a microphone or anything on your side, Ned? No, you're coming through this one though. It'll say Ned is talking. But it, it says the echo's bad. That's what Bob said. Okay, well, Ned's on it. Okay, still no pizza. <laughs> We'll keep you updated on the webinar on the pizza situation. <laughs> so in terms of the AWS services that currently have Graviton support, I mentioned EC2. Very recently, just two, three weeks ago, they announced Lambda support, and that was really the, the impetus for me to put this presentation together because I thought, well, that's cool. That's a really easy way people can start making use of um, Graviton. We've got Elastic MapReduce, RDS, but just in the MySQL, Postgres, Aurora areas, the, the sort of ones based on open source. ElastiCache, both in the Redis and Memcache flavors, OpenSearch. And then you can also build your code on Graviton instances in CodeBuild. Now, interestingly, there might be others um, already using Graviton behind the scenes. AWS had talked about making use of Graviton with their load balancers, where you don't really see the infrastructure behind the scenes. So they may already be doing that. Um, so so well, I think we'll also probably hear more announcements at reInvent. So there may be more services that pick up support. And actually, I think they're sort of platform for running game servers just picked up Graviton support in the last day or so. In terms of operating systems, we're pretty much talking about Linux here. I mean, you free BSD and NetBSD as well, but you're not going to be running Windows Server on, on this anytime soon. I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, there obviously are versions of Windows that run on ARM, so it's a possibility, but at the moment, you're really looking at Linux. But the main things, the main Linux operating systems you would use on Intel or AMD are available, in particular Amazon Linux, Red Hat, etc. Now, in terms of switching, often the easiest things to switch are where you really don't care about what the architecture behind the scenes is. So things where you're using an API or an interface, like a database interface, as long as it conforms to that same API, you don't care whether the compute under the hood is Intel, AMD, or ARM. So those can be really easy to switch. So RDS, MySQL, Postgres, Aurora, ElastiCache, OpenSearch, if you're not aware, OpenSearch is AWS's fork of Elasticsearch. Now, one thing to take, be, be aware of is not Every version of these services supports Graviton. So if you're going to use MySQL in RDS and you want to use Graviton, you need to be running MySQL 8. They haven't sort of backported support to their um, MySQL 5.7, 5.6. In terms of your own applications or applications you run from third parties, pretty much, you know, open source has supported ARM for a long time now. Obviously, you saw on those slides the, the sort of first Raspberry Pi was quite a few years ago, and that was running Linux um, on ARM. But even before then, it's been fairly well supported with Linux. And a lot of um, open source packages have been recompiled and are well supported on ARM. In terms of commercial applications, it's possible that they may run, especially if they're languages that are easily portable. But there's always that question mark around support. Do those companies have support for running it on a particular operating system or particular platform? So that's something you definitely want to check in before you run a particular piece of commercial software on a Graviton processor. In terms of your own architecture, um, your own applications, some of them you can just run without changes, and that's great. 
Some of them you may need to repackage or recompile, and we're going to go through like the list of which ones that's most likely. That's not the end of the world, but it may mean you have to change your build pipelines, do some more regression testing. It's a bit more work. The number that you would have to rewrite is pretty small. Um, sure, if you're using some particular sort of instructions on Intel processors that aren't available on ARM, that may be a breaking change. Um, if you're writing assembly code, sure, it's going to change. But most of us aren't doing that. Most of us are using higher level languages and not getting to that level of sort of instruction set optimization. In terms of easiest to migrate, interestingly, a couple of compiled languages are kind of near the top of this list because the, both Java and .NET, or .NET Core and .NET 5 and 6, just released, um, compile into a bytecode that's sort of an intermediary that then runs on top of a, a runtime that takes that bytecode. And that runtime has to be specific to that platform, but the code you compile isn't. So I think the first time I did something like this with Java was 99, um, where I think I compiled some Java code on a Windows x86 machine and ran it on a Solaris Spark machine, and that worked fine. So I see no reason to believe that my Java code would run fine on an ARM processor in AWS. <laughs> Node is also very portable because pretty much everything in Node is JavaScript. And the engine, because you know people are running JavaScript on their phones all the time, is highly optimized to run on ARM processors. In that more sort of mixed bag group of things, languages like Python and Ruby, possibly PHP, I'm not as familiar with PHP, are well supported. And depending on the libraries you're using, you may be able to deploy it without changes. The thing you've got to aware of is that some libraries in Python and Ruby, but to make them perform better, they've written native code, typically in C, C++, and this native code is often packaged up and put in the package manager, so it just transparently comes down, but sometimes it's not there, and you might, it might need to compile when you download that package. And chances are, most of those compiled versions are for eight x86 processors and not for ARM. That's probably improving over time, but you may find that's why you would need to repackage because it's making use of some native libraries. So you can't just assume that a zip file for a Lambda function for Python with a bunch of dependencies is going to run on ARM without changes. In terms of recompiling, we've got Languages like Golang, Rust, C, and C++, where you're going to need to recompile. But cross-compiling has been a thing for a long time in the sort of C, C++ world. And languages like the tooling for Golang and Rust make it really easy to cross-compile. And you've always got the option of just spinning up an ARM server, whether that's in AWS or somewhere else, and compiling directly for that platform. So it's not a complete barrier to running on Graviton. It just means you need to plan that a bit more when you, you build and package that, especially if you need to support two different architectures in parallel. And then Docker, where a lot of us are doing stuff in Docker. In many ways, you think of Docker as being particularly highly portable, but the reality is Docker containers are architecture specific. So even if your application is a bunch of Java code that runs fine on Intel and ARM, the Java virtual machine that's inside your Docker container is going to be for one or the other, not both. So you would need to make sure your container is built for that particular architecture. Now in terms of actually running your containers, AWS is providing ARM AMIs for use with ECS and EKS, so everything's set up and ready to go on that side, but you will need to make sure that you build your images correctly for a particular architecture. So in the case of building that, you're going to need a base image that supports ARM. Now that's no problem if you're starting with Ubuntu or Debian or something like that, but if you've been using like an image that someone else put together and put in, into Docker Hub that was themselves, they based it on one of those like more base images. They may not have published it for both architectures, so you may need to recreate what they did 
and star from kind of a source image that does support ARM. Now, you can build your own containers for multiple platforms. If you're on Windows using Docker Desktop, there's this idea of Docker Build X. It allows you to build for multiple architectures um, in a single command and then push up to a, um, a repository. And that makes use of some virtualization. And there are ways you can build on Linux. Um, and again, you could just build on that target architecture. You could run a, a sort of CI CD agent on ARM in order to build those containers. And ECR does have support for what are called multi architecture manifests. And I'll show a demo of this later. But essentially, what it means is you can build for both Intel and, and ARM and package them with the same Docker tag. And then at runtime, when it pulls down the image, it says, well, I'm, I'm an Intel machine, give me the Intel version of this. I'm an ARM machine, give me the ARM version of this. And it picks the right one automatically. So let's do some demos. OK. Now this is the point where everything breaks. Um, so I'm going to kick off a couple of, well, three cloud formation stacks here. This is making use of a tool called Stack Manager um, that is a tool for managing um, CloudFormation stacks and their configurations. And what I'm doing is I'm running the same CloudFormation stack with three different set of parameters. The reason I'm doing this is really to demonstrate that a lot of what you do is the same regardless of the CPU architecture. This template is exactly the same. There's nothing conditional in here about the architecture. Um, we've got Peter here now, just because everyone on the webinar wanted to know that, so, but I will keep going. Um, there's nothing specific about the architecture in this template, and all it's doing is it's spinning up an EC2 instance, installing Nginx, modifying the index.html page, and it's echoing out some information um, about the CPU architecture into that index page, so we should be able to see from that what it's running on, and then we start Nginx. And this is just an EC2 instance with a public IP address that I'll print out at the end. But what I'm doing is I'm feeding three different configurations into it. The first one is Intel, and the AMI I'm using comes from Parameter Store, but you can see it's an x86 version of that. And I'm running it on a T3 Micro that's an Intel processor. I've got an ARM version, and I'm using an ARM AMI. And I'm running on a T4G micro, and the G stands for Graviton, so that's an ARM CPU. And then finally, I did want to see what exactly happens if you try and mix and match. You know, in the UI, if you try and stand up an instance like this, and I'll, I'll quickly show that in a minute while this is running, that would not work well. It wouldn't ever let you pick the wrong combination. But in CloudFormation or using um, the CLI, it will sort of allow you to do that mix and match. And then it's, it's interesting to see like at what point it breaks. Now, what I will also show you is, well, what happens if I just go in here and I say, I want to create an instance. Oh, and I've got like a thing hovering, so launch instance. Now, this is the same screen you may have used for launching EC2s manually yourself. What you might have seen or you may not have noticed is we've got this radio button here. And it's basically x86 versus ARM. And if I select ARM, that means I'm going to go for Graviton. And so it's a different version of this AMI. So there's actually two different AMI IDs. I'm just going to use Amazon Linux. The thing you'll notice on this screen is all of these instances that I can select from have a G at the end. We've got some of these single core ones I mentioned, like the C6G. Um, and if I keep scrolling down, you can see all of these are disabled because these aren't ARM processes, so they're not compatible. So it's showing that I can't like mix and match here. So I could go with this T4G micro, and it says free trial available because AWS is actually running a free trial for the Graviton processes of this size until the end of the year. So you can run one of these full time until that point. Um, but other than that, everything here is exactly the same as you would normally see. 
And I'm not actually going to launch this because I'm launching some other via CloudFormation and we can log into one of those, but it's exactly the same process as you would normally see. Now, well, now I've now got a number of CloudFormation stacks. These are the Intel, the ARM, and the Mixed. Um, we look at our Mixed case, our events, oh, not so good, it didn't like that. The architecture ARM64 does not match the architecture of the AMI. So basically, it doesn't let you mix and match, and that's good, because the last thing I'd want is for it to stand up an instance that you then tried to use and was completely unusable because things didn't work. Um, so it's doing some validation there, and it's failed that, and we can just delete that stack. But I've now got two of these, and if I look at the outputs, I've got two IP addresses. Uh -oh, to hide this controls, hide floating meeting controls. So this is my Intel. So, so this is the stack name, and then this is the uname minus a. So we've got x86 in there multiple times, and this is CP, uh, cat proc CPU info. So it shows me my two cores. They both say genuine Intel and some details about that. Great. So I know that one's running on Intel. I've got my ARM one, got an IP address there. Damn, that pizza smells good. And then I've got my ARM version. It doesn't expose nearly as much information about the CPUs, but you can see same kind of format, but different information. This one's running on ARM. What you'll often see is this ARC64 for ARM, rather than actually saying ARM. But this is two identical CloudFormation stacks, apart from the parameters we passed in, both running the same open source software, Nginx, but on completely different CPU architectures without any changes other than the different parameters. I personally think that shows if your use case is running a static website or just Nginx as a reverse proxy to other services, how easy it is to potentially switch to Graviton and make both that performance and cost savings. Okay, so that's kind of the first one. Big applause. Um, now the next thing I've done is a Lambda function. So I've already kind of stood this one up. So we've got an information stack here, and we've got a function. Let me just drag that to the end. What this is doing is it's returning some JSON. The Lambda architecture is what I passed in, so I set this up for x86-64 initially, and then just printing out from some Python code, and I'll show you that in a second, exactly what the architecture it's running on. So the Python code here, I'm just going to hide. Oops, I screwed that up. Um, the Python code is just declared in line. It's a very simple handler. I'm making use of the SAM framework, so it's got a, a oh geez, API gateway in front of it. And all I'm doing is writing out, using this platform library, the processor and the release, and substituting in the passing, passed in architecture. So it's just telling me what it's running on. And if I go to that, the AWS console and I look for Lambda functions, I can look at my function. I can see my code in a second, exactly the same code you saw there. And if I look at my versions, you can see that version 13, because I've been running this back and forth a few times, and it remembers versions even if you delete and recreate, is running on x86-64. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run a CloudFormation update for the C on the config minus the um, so all I'm doing by specifying that is I'm going, going to, to swap this, this lambda, lambda function from Intel to ARM. And I'm going to make, make use of a neat function, functionality within SAM where it can do a, a sort of a linear deployment or a canary deployment using code deploy. Really, it's just these 
three lines in my CloudFormation template or my SAM template that set all of that up. And what it's going to do is every 10 minutes, it's going to migrate 10% of the traffic to the new version of the Lambda function, which just happens to be running on a completely different CPU architecture. But it is exactly the same Python code that I ran before. It's just switching over. And what I'm going to do in another tab is I'm going to do a canary. I'm going to grab this. That's just going to repeatedly call that endpoint. And you can see we're already getting a mix of responses here. It's still going to be mostly the Intel, but it's going to occasionally throw in 10%. It's probably still at 10% of the ARM one. So you can see how it comes back with different responses occasionally. And over time, over 10 minutes, it will fully migrate across. We look at that in the AWS console for the Lambda function. We refresh this version screen. We'll see that we've now got two versions and they're different architectures. And if we look at the aliases, it will tell you the current percentages with 10 and 90%. We go to code deploy, look at deployments. We'll see this deployments in progress and it'll show you now it's switched over to 80 and 20% and it will continue to shift traffic. So this is seamlessly moving the same code from one architect, CPU architect to another. Now I'm not saying you do this in production, really just a demonstration, but you could certainly make use of this ability to split your percentage between the different platforms for a longer period of time and run 10% on ARM until you're comfortable that you're getting the performance and you're not getting errors, um, and then just make the full switch over later. So that's kind of a neat feature there to be able to just do that for a fraction of your traffic. Now, finally, I wanted to show something running with Docker. Um, so I've got my Docker file. It's a very boring Docker file, if you can see that. Um, but essentially, it's just taking Nginx again, um, echoing some information out, the uname minus A, and overwriting the index.html file. Now, if I want to build that, and this is the command I ran to build that, I'll make that a little bigger, if you can see. But I'm using docker build x build, and then I tell it the platforms, and I'm giving it two different platforms. And then I'm saying pushing it, and I'm pushing it up to ECR as Graviton latest. And what it does is it pushes up both those versions of the container for those two platforms. It builds them in parallel, pushes them both up, and then pushes up and manifest with that latest tag that references both of those architectures. So that when I pull that manifest, it then goes ahead and pulls the right actual image. Now, I don't think this is as well represented in um, ECR as I might like. Because um, if I look in ECR here, essentially what I see is that I've got latest in these two untagged images. But one of these, is the ARM, and one of these is the Intel, and this is the manifest itself. So you, you pull this and you then get the right one for the right architecture. So I'd like them to you know, enhance how this looks here so that it gave it you know, more clarity that this is really just one image with two different flavors like you might see on Docker Hub, but I'm sure that will come over time. The thing I'm concerned about with this is if you have lifecycle policies, Often you'll get rid of things that are untagged, and I don't know how that would handle this. I suspect it would delete these images that are the real images. So then if I look at ECS template, what I'm doing here in this CloudFormation template, and I'm not going to go through all the details of it, because while I may find CloudFormation fascinating, I realize not everyone does. But essentially, I'm creating an ECS cluster to run Docker containers, and I'm creating it with two EC2 instances. One is Intel, one is ARM, one is, yeah, Graviton. Um, I'm calling it Graviton demo. I create my roles, my security groups, a load balancer, ARM instance, an x86 instance. They register with the cluster. 
put my load balancer in front. I declare an ECS service. I've got a task definition. You can see the task definition just says Graviton latest. It doesn't do anything that's architecture specific. Nowhere in this is architecture specific. The only thing we do is when we declare the service, we're saying, I want two copies of it, and please spread it over availability zones and instances. So I've got my two instances in different availability zones. So that should ensure that one's running on one platform and the other's running on the other. And then I output the DNS name. So I go back to CloudFormation, I can grab that DNS name. And what do I see here? I got ARM. Refresh it, x86. Refresh it. So again, same Docker file, same ECS cluster, same task definition and service definition. It's just happening to run on a sort of multi-architecture cluster. And depending upon which one I happen to hit, and it's just doing a round robin on the load balancer, I'm running on an entirely different CPU architecture. So again, this can be quite easy. You could swap in a small percentage of your EC2 compute in a cluster like this to run ARM and run an ARM version of your container and run it in parallel until you're comfortable and want to move everything across. Okay. Now, one quick thing just to show finally, you can see this is still running because it takes 10 minutes. Um, Let's, and if we look here, we'll see we've got our Graviton demo cluster. We've got our service name. We've got our ECS instances. These are the EC2 instances, and we can see they're both running one task. So that matches up to what we're seeing. Here, we don't really see those different architectures, but if I dug down to these, these EC2 instances, you'd be able to see that there. Now, if I want to look at some of these other services that support Graviton now. I'm not going to launch a database, um, but I do think it's interesting if I go through the process when it finally loads the screen um, of creating a database. I'm going to say, let's create a database. I'm going to do standard create and I'm going to say MySQL. MySQL community version 8. Just say dev test for now. Scroll down to this area DB instance class. By default, it's selected Graviton. That shows a level of confidence in using these CPUs that the default for people launching MySQL through this wizard is to pick a Graviton ARM processor. Now, I can still go in there and change it to one of these M5s that's an Intel processor, but by default, they're pushing you towards Graviton because you're not going to know the difference when you interact with this database. So I thought that was interesting when I went in and went through this and saw, oh, they're actually making it the default. And it's going to be cheaper and potentially faster as well. So yeah, that's pretty cool. OK. So just kind of summarizing some of those benefits. That improved total cost of ownership, better performance for your dollars. That's a great thing. Um, really easy to use in some of these cases. And many of your applications, you can just run without changing anything. We don't know quite what they're using for Graviton 4 already behind the scenes. I'm sure it's just going to increase. And AWS has shown that they're really investing in custom silicon. So not just these Graviton processors. They've been talking about their Nitro system that manages their VMs, which allows them to offload a lot of the work the VMs do in terms of networking and storage connectivity and running the virtual machines so that when you get your your virtual machine, you're getting as much of that CPU and some of it's not being set aside to run the VM management and everything else that goes with being a VM. But then they've also created these Inferentia and Trainium um, chips for running machine learning tasks, again, building their own custom silicon. It's a trend we see in the other cl cloud platforms as well, but I think AWS has gone further than the others in terms of custom hardware. As I mentioned, they've got a sort of free tier available for these T4G, T4G micro instances until the end of the year. And it's part of this Graviton challenge. The idea is it's like a four day process where you're supposed to walk through these steps and move an application to Graviton by following those steps. So you can 
look at that, just search for Graviton Challenge and you'll find this page. Um, there's also the possibility to join a Slack channel and get a $25 credit if you're interested. Now, reInvent's coming up very shortly. I did a search through the session catalog and found at least five sessions talking about either custom silicon or graviton. So it's clearly a big deal. And this is not counting anything where they may announce something new and create, put a session on, you know, additionally that's not listed yet. I do strongly suspect there will be other graviton related announcements at reInvent. Um, personally, the thing I'm really hoping to see is Fargate support for um, Graviton. So at the moment, Fargate's kind of the serverless container option that runs with ECS and EKS. They just released, of all things, Windows support, Windows container support for Fargate, which was surprising. Um, both Fargate and Lambda use a micro VM called, I think, Firecracker. And the fact that they've started releasing Lambda which is used as Firecracker with ARM, means it's obviously ready to go for, each, um, for Fargate. So I think it's just a matter of time. They may just be waiting to announce it at reInvent, or there may be just a few stumbling blocks. But I'm sure it's coming soon. So that, because Fargate's always had the challenge of being a bit more expensive than running your own EC2 instances. So getting an extra, hopefully, 20% cost saving on that would be nice. And of course, better performance. Okay, and that's really it. So questions either from the room or for the audience. I'm looking at the chat over here. I had a question. Sure. I did notice on the, um, uh, the Docker images, I think they did have different sizes. I didn't know if that was a way to be able to tell if one was ARM and if one was uh, Intel. Yeah, so the question from the room was like about the sort of Docker sizes as a way of distinguishing that you've got the two different versions of Intel and ARM. And that's certainly true that because the size of the executables within those containers is going to be a bit different if, you know, just the binaries are going to be slightly different, different sizes. sizes. But it's not a way that you could reliably identify them. Um, but it shows that they're not exactly the same container. I mean, if you download it and you inspect that container, it will tell you that the architecture is AMD or, or into AMD 64 or, or ARM 64. Um, that's how it's distinguished. Okay. Um, so you mentioned before there's probably certain scenarios that make uh, on not as good of a choice as Intel potentially. I didn't hear you say like, like for a, as an example of one of those things. I was just curious, like what what would be a workload that you'd be running that would like actually you'd be better off sticking with Intel or like yeah. taking the price there? So the question is what sort of workloads would you be better sticking with something like Intel? I I think more specialized software where it's been heavily optimized for some of those instructions, like is it AVX five one two and things like that, some of these specialized instructions on the Intel processors that aren't always available and and that there's very sort of niche cases where that may apply. Um, a lot of the general purpose benchmarks that have been run on Graviton show it to be faster, but you can't guarantee that across the board. So I think you need to benchmark. If it's something that's particularly performance sensitive, you, you need to make sure one against the other and see how it performs. So we can't say across the board, everything is going to run faster on Graviton. That's simply not true. But an awful lot of things will because it's essentially got more horsepower, even if it may not have some of these specialized instruction sets. I mean, that's kind of the whole arm or risk philosophy is having less instructions, less specialized instructions. Now, that was the founding philosophy. Over time, they've added more specialized instructions um, for certain use cases, whether that's video decoding or various other things. Um, but there's still areas that they've specialized with and, and optimized in some, in some of like AMD and Intel chips. Okay. 
Uh, I think test and benchmark, and that's why it's great if you can set something up so that you're running a small percentage of your traffic on Graviton, and you can see in the real world with production loads how the two are, are performing against each other. Any questions from the chat? They all got disgusted because we got pizza and they didn't. <laughs> Jealous March. Okay, well, if there are no questions, oh, is there a pineapple on any of the pizza? I don't know, I haven't seen the pizza yet, so. <laughs> don't rub it in. <laughs> Well, um, thank you everyone on the, the webinar um, for sort of coming along. I hope you found it interesting and useful. I, I'd, be, I'd love to hear from some of you if you actually make use of Graviton. And we've got some upcoming projects at Leading Edge where we're looking because we're starting kind of from scratch. So we have the ability to start with it day one. So I think that's going to be really exciting to do. Um, and I look forward to what they announce at reInvent as well, because I'm sure there's going to be something. So thanks, everyone, and that's kind of it. Thank you.